All right, good evening, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the DTM Podcast. I'm Devin Dunnigan, and here with me, as always, is Mr. Stephen Mott. How you doing, brother? Great, brother. Jake Z. Drummer today. All righty, and we also have here Mr. Gerald Pete Turner. How you doing, brother? Ed King. (laughs) And we also have with us a fourth person here, and that's Mr. James Dean Potts. How you doing, brother? I'm doing fine this day. What about you? I'm doing good. Thanks, Brad. So today we're going to be talking about the 1980 record by the Allman Brothers Band, Reach for the Sky. So this was kind of an oddball pick for me. I like my oddball albums, my weird albums. And so I just kind of thought of an artist we hadn't done on the podcast, and this was the one that kind of came to and I picked this record very obscure and we did do the Almond Bits band a while back which is I guess you could say is kind of a, a spinoff of the Almond Brothers band it's the two main people's sons Dickie Betts and Greg Almond's sons but I mean yeah this particular record was released in August 1980 produced by Mike Lawler and Johnny Cobb, Mike Lawler would end up joining the band for this tour. And this is the very first album on the Arista Records label. And pretty much going into this record, the band had reunited in 78. And then in 79, they put out Enlightened Rogues, which to me was a great comeback record. And that was on Capricorn Records, which is the record label they had been on throughout their career up to that point. But the label ended up filing for bankruptcy, and eventually the band signed to this one. And this album and the next one were kind of blemishes in the Allman Brothers legacy, really and truly. To, I mean, most Allman Brothers fans dislike both of these albums, and the band sure enough does. I mean, you, I've read Greg Allman's book or a section of Greg Allman's book on these. He said he doesn't even own these two records. He says that he... It it was not the Allman Brothers. And I can see that, and I'll talk about it as we go through the songs and all. But, I mean, yeah, this is a weird album, but I think there's some decent moments on here. I'll just go ahead and say. But to say this is a good album, I mean, it's, it's not a good record. It's probably more bad than good, but like I said, it's kind of a thing of where the highs are high and the lows are low. And I, I just really think this record, maybe if it was stripped down, and you, you're you going to hear me say that throughout the review, if it was stripped down, it may have would have turned out to be a lot better than what it end up, ended up being. But, I mean, we'll get to that on the songs. But, yeah, I mean, two oddball albums in the discography. We're only talking about the first one here. We'll probably go back and do Brothers, Brothers of the Road later on down the line. But, yeah, I mean... Two ill ill represented albums, kind of least represented albums in the catalog if when it comes to greatest hits packages and stuff like that. I own a greatest hits package that has uh, about half of this album and the next album on it, and it's called Hell and High Water, Best of the Arista Years. It's a pretty cool compilation. I've listened to that several times preparing for this review. But I mean, yeah, this is a weird album, so Let's jump into it with the very first track. So, Hell and High Water. So, this opens up with this kind of weird choir intro. And right off the bat, it's just kind of different. I mean, starting it off with this weird choir thing and kind of gospel singers there. I mean, it's, it's just kind of whatever. But then it goes into this kind of more traditional Allman Brothers intro, kind of a breakdown style intro. But I like that, and then it goes into kind of this funky, groovy song. And I, I don't really hate this song that much. I think that, like I said, the sound is different right off the bat. But it, it's a fine song if maybe the bells and whistles were going out of this one. I mean, that that to me ruins this whole entire record. But, I mean, there's some good guitar work. The lyrics, I'm not the biggest fan of. I think they're a little too cheesy, kind of rah-rah, sis, boom, bah. We've been through it all. We're back again, stronger than ever, when really, 
I mean, by the next album, they were back at each other again, and by 1982, they were they were broken up. But I mean, I like the duet between Dickie Betts and Greg Allman, and the, musically, it's it's kind of more traditional Allman Brothers, and I mean, it, it's a pretty decent opener for what it is. So I mean, not much else to say other than that. So Steve, take Hell and High Water. Well, I simply hated it. Every frolic of my body hated this record and this song. So, spoiler alert, um, this is crap. I mean, I could do without it. And, in fact, I will for the rest of my life because it sucked. That's it. All righty. So, Dean, take hell and high water. Okay, well, this... This song wasn't, yeah, it was quiet, but like you said, they went into three different whole categories into one song. I like the title of the song, but, uh, and actually this one's got a pretty good, uh, bass line on it. Like you can hear the bass, but it's, uh, it's a funny song. It's like, it sucks. But, uh, yeah, the bass line, the name of it, and the little shape she sang at the beginning, the shape she sang, I don't know what that was for. That was, anyhow. But anyhow, yeah, on to you. All righty, so Pete, take Hell and High Water. Only good thing it was going for it was it had a good bass line on it. And a couple of guitar riffs on it. And that's about it. The rest of it kind of sucked. All righty. So then we move to the next track on here, Mystery Woman. So right off the bat, very commercial sounding intro. And overall, it has an extremely commercial sound to it. Kind of a poppy, kind of, kind of Michael McDonald, Doobie Brothers style sound to it. And I think it honestly would have worked a bit better as more of a straight blues song. And I, I like the dual guitar work and the, the guitar solo is very good as well. Overall, I, I think it's a decent track, but I mean, once again, if it was stripped down, I think it could have been so much better. I think this would have worked kind of, I mean, all my brothers, I mean, they're pretty much a rhythm and blues band. <laughs> I mean, that's all it is to it. I mean, of course, Southern rock as well, but I mean, at the genesis of it all, they're a southern, I mean, a blues, rhythm and blues band. So, I mean, overall, I think this one would have worked much more stripped down. Maybe kind of have a blind love by B.B. King, which they covered on the previous album. Maybe have, maybe have a feeling of that song or something, kind of this kind of mid tempo, bluesy, kind of bouncy song. I mean, if that makes any sense at all. So, Stephen, take Mystery Woman. I wish this song would bounce away quickly and far away, because I hate it. And um, Back Into You by Sammy Hagar is a great song. Okay, and I agree. So, Dean, take Mystery Woman. Mystery Woman, uh, it's actually kind of good in, to me. I'm not much of a Southern rocker. Or whatever, but uh, this one might be one of the only ones on this album that was actually way the quiet a little bit. But uh, I mean, I don't know if I fully got the meaning of it, but I think it had a good meaning to it. I, I think so. Mystery Woman, whatever. It had a nice slick sound to it. It was pretty uh. It was a kind of a flushing song, but it's probably one of the better ones, or one of the best ones on the album, for sure. So, yeah. All righty. So, Pete, take Mystery Woman. It can mysteriously go away. All righty. So, then we move to the next track on here. And that is from the Madness of the West. So this is the signature instrumental on the album. And 
to me, the first really, really outright great song on here, I think halfway, though, booing by all these bells and whistles. I mean, I kind of like the overall sound of the guitars and the drums itself, but my gosh, with the, with all the synthesizers and harpsichord or whatever's in there, I mean, it, it's it drags it down. I mean, it's it's very very of the time, and I, it's something that the Allman Brothers is just definitely not. But I mean, some great drumming all across, some great guitar work, and has a guitar solo, which is very odd, and that's. Mike Lawler, I'm sure, is playing that because, of course, he joined the tour as the keyboardist. And I mean, a great keyboardist, but guitar does not belong in this band at all. So, I mean, it's kind of a misstep to me in this album and the band's career. I mean, if he would have just played maybe piano during that or something, maybe. I mean, Chuck Lavelle was doing keyboard work with the band, and I mean, he he had it down pat. But th this one, I think they just tried to. A little bit too hard to be commercial, but from my from my understanding, it was the record label that really pushed them in this more commercial route. So I mean, yeah, I mean, just kind of whatever with the whole bells and whistles approach, like I was talking about. And I love the drum break in the middle; it's kind of like one way out to do a drum solo. I like that, and it's overall a very great instrumental and a great structured instrumental. But I mean, yeah. One of the highlights for me on this record, just minus all the bells and whistles, but I can look over that for the most part on this record. I mean, if you listen to it with good headphones, I mean, you can hear some of kind of the Hammond organ in there, kind of Greg Allman playing the organ and stuff like that. You can hear that a lot more. If that was brought up in the mix, maybe it would have sounded a little bit more traditional and kind of the Allman Brothers sound. But yeah, I mean, it is what it is. I, I read a quote by Dickie Betts saying in the Dreams booklet, which I got that box set today, and he said that there were moments on there, but by the time they got to the next album, it was kind of, it was pretty much the nail was in the coffin with the band. And I mean, of course, they reunited in 89, and they, they were together until 2017, but I mean, yeah, I mean, great track, so Stephen Tate from the Madness of the West. Um. I, I don't know. This song made me mad. So, Dean, take from the Madness of the West. It it it's got the uh, almond bloody sound, in my opinion. Uh, it the name of it pretty much matches the um sound of it. It's the Satan little things they did on guitar, like the Satan notes they would hit and the Satan way they played. And, uh, yeah, later on, like, it starts out really good, and then, like, later on into the track, they started just adding a whole bunch of junk onto it, and it that adding on to it just ruined it even more. But it it sounds like from the madness of the West. So I got to give it that. It sounds like what it needs to sound like, but I mean, uh, there's nothing, there's nothing much else for this one except for it matching what it sounds like. All righty. So Pete, take from the madness of the West. It was terrible. It's all. All righty, so then we move to the next track and the closer of side one on this record. This is a very short record, by the way, but closer of side one, I got a right to be wrong. So this was later covered by Hank Williams Jr. on the Rowdy album from 81, and I, that's a good record, actually, But and that's, that's actually a pretty good version of this song, but I, I'd consider this one more or less filler, but it's not bad. It's kind of catchy. I, I can kind of see the... If this if this was one that was released as a single, I could totally see that. It has kind of this catchy value to it, and it's kind of a standard boogie rocker. I would prefer maybe if they went more like kind of a Jay Lee Lewis style with kind of a little bit more piano and stuff in it. I kind of would have liked that. Maybe some, some piano lead or whatever, but 
I, I, I like that. I like the slide work in the song overall. And you've got some bad synth bass in the background. You can, if you're listening with headphones, you can faintly tell it. But there, there's it's this horrible synth bass, and it's just it just does not fit this band. I mean, it, this these synths and all this sound effects and crap they throw in this album just does not fit. Just does not fit at all. But overall, not a bad song. I just wish it was more stripped down. But I mean, it was performed live, so I mean, I guess. Saying that it was filler, I mean, I guess the band didn't think so. So, I mean, Stephen, take, I got a right to be wrong. Well, this one was wrong, because <laughs> it sucked. I'm here to tell you, folks, ladies and gentlemen, residents of Mount Vernon and other various parts of this area, it sucked. So, I just don't know. I mean... And I, I don't know. I really don't. Back to you, Devin. All right. So, Dean, take I Got a Right to Be Wrong. Um, The only thing I could really say I liked about this song is the drums. That's about the only thing I liked about it. And uh, I did actually hear one time that it was uh, covered or made by Hank Williams, too. But, uh, that's about it for this one. Yeah, it's one of the bad ones that kind of stick out like a sore thumb, you know. Well, I mean, really, this whole album's a sore thumb, but this one, it, it was one of the bad ones. It's one of the ones that we're sitting here talking about how bad it is because of how bad it is. But, yep, the drums is the only light up of this song. But you, Devin. All righty, so Pete, take I Got a Right to Be Wrong. It was bad, 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 bad. That's bad it. All righty, so then we turn this sucker over to side two, to the opener of side two, Angeline. So another decent song ruined by bells and whistles not a fan of all of these synths and stuff. I'll say it again, just not a fan of all of this. But a great chorus, some great vocals by Greg Allman, and some decent guitar in the solo, but kind of, it, it's it's decent, but that's about it. I mean, it's nothing mind-blowing in my opinion. And otherwise, I mean, like I said, decent song, good song, so... This was actually represented on the Dreams box set. This was one of the only songs from this era to be represented. So evidently the band itself thought something of it. So, I mean, this and the song off the next album were the only two songs from this era to even be featured. So, I mean, I think it covers the basis, though. I think this is a really decent song for the time. Like I said, a little. if it was just stripped down, maybe it would have been a little bit better. So, Stephen, take... Angeline. It's a song when it's on the album. All righty. So, Dean, take Angeline. I like the name of this song. Like, I feel like that would be a good name for somebody's daughter, or if you had a daughter. Anyways, it had a funky sound to it. Kind of funny song, but... uh. Yeah, the that when you start adding a whole bunch of stuff to a song or to a bunch of songs, like it sometimes it doesn't make it better, it makes it worse. Like you were saying, they started adding the bells and the whistles and it kind of just blew the whole thing. It's like dropping fire on top of ice. And uh Yeah, this uh it went terrible it, because of the bells and the whistles. But And then they tried to do the little, I don't even know what you call it anymore, but they just started adding stuff. And I think this one's kind of fairly actually. But, yep, that's about it. The name of it is what I like. And I just thought it was a funky sounding song. And it was kind of funny a little bit, but. Aside from that, that's all I can get from it. 
Fight by E. All righty. So Pete, take Angeline. It's song. It has words. And there's music. All righty. So we then move to the next track. Two. And that. <laughs> So we move to the next track on here, Famous Last Words. So a decent song, but filler. I kind of understand the concept of the lyrics and all, but they're kind of stupid, honestly. I, I, the concept is kind of interesting, but I mean, eh, eh, eh. But probably the worst song on this record, in my opinion. And this was co-written with Bonnie Bramlett, actually. And a decent solo on here, and musically, it's kind of traditional Almond Brothers. I can see it on some of the earlier albums. So, Stephen Tate, famous last word. It's bad. It's 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 horrible. I mean, it's menacing. And the darkest eyes. Halloween Kills was way better than this. Pilgrim was way better than this. It had too many bells and whistles. Sammy Hagar is the same person as Devin Dunnigan. Just a Gigolo is a better album. Alrighty, so Dean, take famous last words. Steven kind of low blowed this one when he said Halloween Kills was better than this. That was pretty that was pretty bad, but uh yeah, it I like the I sort of like the lyrics. They kind of get screwed up, but um, I kind of like what they was trying to go for. But it was another one of those, like you said, a uh, filler song and uh, just ruined. Like, you know, they could have made, I don't know how hard they was trying to make this record if they was just throwing it together or whatever was going together to just start throwing stuff in to see if it would sound good. But, uh, yeah, this, yep, it got ruined pretty fast. And, yeah, it, uh, but that seems about right. Seems about what this song would do. Definitely for the name of it, Famous Last Words. I, I, I was actually hoping that was the Famous Last Words of this album, but, I mean, there's two more songs. So, so Pete, take Famous Last Words. It was terrible. After the first couple of songs, it starts sounding the same and the same all over again. All righty. So we then move to the next track. Keep on keeping on. So this is the Almond Brothers doing funk. And it's decent, but still, I would have preferred this if it was stripped down in a more stripped down kind of, I guess, a way to put it, an acoustic arrangement. But, I mean, some good bass work in the chorus. David Goldflees is a good bass player. I've heard Greg Allman in his book say he didn't care too much for him. But, I mean, good bass player in my opinion. And then more guitar, and it's especially kind of in this dual guitar manner. It's like they're going from guitar to guitar, and it just does not work. And the solo after the kind of dual is good. Probably the best guitar solo on this record, in my opinion. So, yeah, overall, not bad. Just kind of, kind of whatever. So, Stephen, take, keep on keeping on. No. All righty, so Dean, take, keep on keeping on. Just another one of them songs on the album. Just another one of the quiet shows that happened. But uh, I do like the beginning of it, but that's about it. And uh, keep on keeping on, keeping on, whatever, how you ever you say it. It's it's a good point. It's just the name of it, but it, yeah, that. And then the key tour and the, you name it, it. But yeah, that's about it for this one. Yep, that's all I can give it. All righty, so Pete, take 
keep on keeping on. It was terrible. All righty. So we then move to the next track, the closer of the album. And that is so long. So this is an okay song, but once again, if it was stripped down, it would be even better. And has kind of an interesting, I, I was thinking earlier, kind of a dreamlike vibe to it that's what i kept thinking of it's kind of a dreamy sort of just kind of maybe snow on, snows on the ground you sit by a fireplace or something like that that's the kind of vibe it gives me kind of this warm sort of dreamlike I, I don't it's it's a weird vibe to it i put interesting in my notes but i kind of like the bluesier chorus of it and there's some good guitar work and it definitely works as kind of a capper to the album but yeah i mean it's a good song, and I mean, it's a song and it's on the album. So, Steve, take so long. Oh, uh, I mean, yeah, I, I agree with you. One thing you said there that it's a song and it's on the record. Uh, I don't know what gear this record is from, I really don't care. I don't know anything about this particular band. I think this is the best one on the album. And uh, for the end of the album, for the song that ends the album, it's actually a very good um, outro to the album. The name and the sound and everything about it. But this this one song, it's like that song that you miss because well i hate all of these ones and they sound so much the same and they sound so crappy i don't want to listen to the rest of it i mean it sounds good in the beginning for the most part but yeah that's about it so pete take so long i say so long to this freaking album because it's far out All righty, so that's the album review. That is another episode of the DTM podcast. <clears throat> and getting into kind of the ratings of the album. So overall, I would give this a three and a half out of ten. It's definitely not one of my favorites. It's one of the worst in the catalog. I'd probably say this is the worst. And I think the one after it, even though it's not much better, it still has it has kind of a more coherent vibe. So, Stephen, what is your rating and final thoughts on this record? Well, my rating is zero out of ten, and my reasoning is because it's horrible, like a prick, and that's it. I just don't know. I recommend Michael Myers and David. Yes. Anko. Yes. All right. So, Dean, what is your rating and final thought on this record? Um, this one's got a low score on my book. It's uh, I I will give it a two because it only had a few little light ups, and it was a short album. Which, I mean, that's actually a good thing because all the songs is bad and you don't want a huge album with a bunch of bad songs that sound the exact same. Two is my score on this one. Back to you, Devin. All righty. So, Pete, what is your rating and final thoughts for this record? My final rating is one and a half because I didn't have Ed King in it playing guitar solos on it. All righty, so now we will and get David into David Allen my... Coe. All right, I got you. So, Jr. so now we will get into our picks of the week, movie and album picks. So I'm going to go first here. I already got it written down, ready to go. So the movie pick of the week for me is going to be probably 
to most people a pretty bad movie, but it's one I happen to really enjoy just because of the sheer madness of it, and that is Saw the Final Chapter. Yeah, that, that's my movie pick of the week, and my album pick of the week is Molly Hatchet, Double Trouble Live. So I was just listening to this album today. This is a great live album. I mean, it was kind of, I think it was kind of their attempt to save their career. I mean, yeah, that's my picks of the week. So, Stephen, what are your picks of the week? My picks of the week uh, is David Allen Coe and Michael Myers. Dean, what is your picks of the week? Um, I'd like, uh, now this movie is one that I would honestly review myself. Because it just seems like a movie that somebody would review. It just looks like one of those. But this movie is called Jackals. And for my album, I'm probably going to say um, Skid Row. Skid Row, the album. There you go. All righty. So, Pete, what are your picks of the week? Billy Strings and... uh. Corkies. All righty. So there you go. There you have it. That is another episode of the DTM podcast. And yeah, go check us out on our new YouTube page. It's titled DTM slash New Ridge Line. We're putting them all together now. I mean, brand new page. I've talked about it a little bit before. We had to start a new page because of my phone and all got screwed up and uh, when I was switching over accounts because my phone got messed up. But, yeah, that's it. That's the podcast. And like I said, like, comment, subscribe. And as I always say, close this thing off. God bless you all. Stay safe. Stay free. Stay healthy. Stay frosty. And God bless you all. And we will see you next time.